with, with integration, I like to open it up like this year. How has integration served us as, as, as black people? Has it got better? Has it got worse? Are we right now in our current position? Do you think it works? Um, so I think it ties in with both parts of sort of to the topics we're going to touch on today in the sense where I feel like integration does serve people overall and it can be there, there's definitely pros to it do you get what I mean because everybody kind of because then well most people have something to offer so in terms of whether it be agriculturally or what well, agriculture or if you're referring to um, trades and you know I guess for example in nowadays economy it's a lot to do with like education whether it be finance or you know just sort of different matters so I think overall integration is a positive thing and it can be a positive thing I think the reason why it hasn't served us is because of the way in which it's been done so for example people are being ripped off so most big brands go to third world countries it's seen as oh well, we're doing a good thing because you know they're getting paid we're giving them jobs but they're getting pennies in comparison to what you would be paying a tailor here, you know? And I guess that's what keeps the business going there, but you, you're literally getting people that are being paid, what, like 20p an hour. Like, it's a bit of a joke. So I, I feel like the selfishness and greed that's incorporated into how it runs in society today doesn't serve, it doesn't serve us. I don't think it serves most um, countries that will be classed as minority countries. I don't think it does at all. But the clash is this. We can't fit in their society. It just doesn't work anymore. Uh, we've tried that. We've, we've, we've pulled up our bootstraps. We've pulled up our trousers. You know, we started applying for, you know, um, better jobs, started to get a better education. And we still find racism. We still find prejudice. We still find, even from other groups, because of this, again, class system. So you've got, um, which we're going to get into other groups in a sec but you've got this consistent notion of you're not good enough. Yeah. You know, so if I was to go for a job interview with my hair like this and twists, you know, I'll, I'll be getting people like, I wonder why you just cut your hair. Like, why you... you know the ones there like, cut your hair and don't. The idea of just make it easier for yourself and conform. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally that. Mm. So I feel, like, I feel like with the whole conforming thing now, this is where I get upset, and this is where I think integration hasn't worked. Again, let me uh, before I get onto that, I want to speak about some good parts. Yes, we have um, we have learned to um, I should say we have enjoyed the luxury of other cultures. We have enjoyed the the luxury of having that uh, multicultural environment. But again, is that an illusion? Because those same multicultural groups practice the same segregation or, or, or anti-black racism towards us as well as black people so I feel like mm. I don't know would, would, would you what do you think on the whole clash of integration us being accepted us not being accepted and that so I feel like there's I feel very conflicted and I feel like I'm gonna contradict myself in speaking because I do like to go to other countries I do like to see you know and understand their cultures and experience it for the time that I'm there but I also understand that my experience as a tourist visiting your country is not the same experience as the black people that live there for example um the visit in Morocco and you had a lot of a sedan looking males there like trying to sell glasses like doing all kind of um the like side hustle jobs they, they weren't in the places that you like it wasn't evenly spread out and that's Morocco's in Africa so regardless of the fact that it's in North Africa it's still in Africa but you yeah. can still see the segregation there um and so it's like a part of me yes I do go and I do enjoy it as a tourist but I also understand that you know potentially what it what I'd be going through if I was black and in that country you know it's the same with other countries that I've visited, but then I also feel like you kind of get that everywhere. So it's, it's like the UK, you have some people that are anti-racist that aren't black. You have some people that are racist that aren't black. You have people that are neither here nor there. They don't really see it, don't pay attention to it. 
<laughs> it's like over their heads. And I feel like you kind of get that wherever you go. So I do feel like to some degree, yes, there's that enjoyment part of it. But I feel also like the society we live in, black people are, you know, so you're okay as long as we're getting you to spend your money. If I went into an establishment and I didn't put down no money, didn't buy nothing, didn't pay for a meal, the way I'd be treated would probably be very different <laughs> if I'm a paying customer. <laughs> You want me to, you want my mind good for as long as you can take my money. And I feel like that's why even the way in which um, we touched on it before about the whole cultural um, idea of, especially nowadays in the UK specifically, and even in America, to be fair, that whole ideology of spend your money, buy all these diamonds, all these like buy, 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 buy. It's a whole consumerist ideology is given. And it's like, you're okay as long as you're doing that. But what happens when you stop or if you can't? You know? Yeah, you're right. You know what? Um, <laughs> it's, 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 um, it's, it's funny when you're talking about how you would get treated if you was to, you know, not pay for your... Uh, it's, it's funny because, that, again, what people were saying during this whole um, recent George Floyd death, like, you know, the, the passing of George, say, the murder of George Floyd and all the protests is you're finding that... <laughs> You're getting white people um, saying things like, "Ah, oh, you know, um, if you if you just like if you stop to walk, like if you stop jaywalking or um, if you uh, if you stop running your mouth when you're getting you know harassed by the police and if you stop doing all these different things, I'm just like, it doesn't matter what we do because all the people that have died, majority of them that have died from police brutality in America and in the UK, um, it does happen in the UK. It just doesn't happen on the streets. It happens in custody." A lot of people yeah. forget it happens in, in your while they're in custody where there's no cameras to see, obviously, but eyewitnesses and whatever. But anyway, what you find is that it doesn't matter. And all those people that have died from police brutality haven't been armed. They haven't been, um, not all of them, some of them, the majority of them, I should say, haven't been aggressive or it's always been an enforced nature. And like you said about even Morocco, which is very interesting because, yes, it's in Africa. And then you've got Sudanese people coming into, or, or people from the, um, the Gambia, you know, coming into, or Senegal, coming to work in Morocco. Yeah. And yeah. they're being discriminated against. But it's supposed to be Africa. It's supposed to be the same continent that everyone's from, which shows mm. you, again, from other groups, that whole, um, you know, uh, subculture of, of, of integration. We're going to practice um, desegregation as well with certain groups, because, again, when we include black people into the fold integration for some reason in their eyes doesn't work or they don't want it to work you know? yeah so uh, I, I find the same in spain as well um i find the same in uh, I, find, I find it to be the same in spain in portugal and wherever i mainly most places where i go to there's always black people um sometimes asian or indian people um and with the communities now we have the task force like trident in these specific communities there's no trident for asian communities or chinese communities or arab communities you know mm -hmm. we have a lot of um police presence in our areas we have a lot of um you know low low council estate housing inside our areas as well and you yeah. tend to find that i mean now obviously someone would argue and say oh not go to brixton brixton looks nice yeah because it's being gentrified at the moment and um we're going to get to gentrification in a sec as well because I think that's a really important topic to talk about when it comes to integration. But yeah, like it, it seems for me, yeah, that no matter where we go, what we do, you know, we're always going to be targeted. So with the other groups, this is where they now practice that anti-black racism towards us because what they're realizing is that oh wow, so these guys are. The black people are known to be, you know, um, thugs, as they call us, um, ruffians or stupid or whatever. Yeah. So let's not be like them. Let's not be like them. And let's practice it more on a European. You know, let's practice our integration more of Europeans. And that way, you know, we will be more accepted. And then on the same note, start to build their shops their businesses in our community and take our money and then mm. go and practice that outside. Can you, can you see the mockery? Can you see? Yeah. And it's peak. It's peak. 
Yeah, sorry, go on. It's even like, you know, like with, with the way um, New York Central Park, what they call Central Park in New York now, that whole big middle... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even with how that built up, I'm not sure if that... Um, I think we do know about the history of it a bit, where there were a lot of people who were coming from foreign countries who weren't accepted. This is when racism... Um, yeah, racism was becoming... Like, slavery was actually becoming abolished. Sorry, I said racism, that's mm. still there. Slavery was becoming um, yeah. illegal. And so they were turning away from it. And but the issue was is obviously even if we've turned away from it, the same thing that we see with racism. Even if you're saying it can't happen anymore, then I'm just going to make it impossible for you to live anywhere in my neighbourhood. So if you're getting beaten, no jobs, treated a certain way, you're going to move away. It's the idea. So what they found was happening was that a lot of people who were black or from other my my I hate that word, but yeah, minorities, <laughs> you were moving to partic- to a particular part of um new york where there were less people and it there were more slaves basically free in that part of the town and so what was happening is they began to build their own economy because there were like documents the evidence that there were all these different um shops and things like that running and there were only people who were who had migrated to america in those particular areas so they were like clearly this isn't this day and age where it's like catch a train catch a bus so your businesses were local you know and it's the whole idea of that happening and then i think what happened they they burnt out and they bought out and burnt out most of the place so it's like if you've been pushed i think the the thing to remember is anywhere where there's a lot of black people tends to be immediately classed as ghetto one (laughs) <laughs> or it's it's dangerous you know so there's all this fear incited around there being the idea of any sort of I don't know like any sort of area that's kind of populated by black people it's just these are the negative connotations people have of it and so if that's the case why are they go why am I going to bring my business there why am I going to come there to buy anything from you I'm going to stay away from it and apart from the fact that it's been made difficult to happen <laughs> It's like, especially, I guess for me, growing up in East, most of the shops around me are either owned by Asian or white people. When I say white people, the bigger shops. Most of the corner shops are all owned by Asian families. So I feel like I have definitely digressed, but there's definitely a point that I'm coming around to. But I think with the way in which it has been made, basically my main point is just, I think it's been made very, very difficult for black people to do that, whether it be due to the way in which other people look at black people and black businesses and or it's that fear so actually I'm never coming anywhere near it so I I think it kind of makes it difficult for there to be a fair integration because then and then the thing is in a way it's left to just black people then okay black people will go to a black shop they're not did you get what I mean most black people aren't scared to approach black businesses but then you see all these memes online trending about oh most black businesses like I heard somebody say today and I was so confused as to how you're pushing a black narrative but also saying it's um, well a lot of black businesses are really bad a lot speaking on many companies <laughs> do you get what i mean so yeah. the narrative that's being pushed out there i think there's all these blocks in all these different ways to then take on the idea of how the black community is seen by other people it just adds in these challenges <laughs> do you get what i mean yeah. it's like there's all these blocks and I think it's layered, layered blocks. And it's also, I think the point as to me bringing up New York and Central Park was that when it's been done, it's been taken away. <laughs> it's been burnt away. It's the problem. So yeah, eventually people are going to stop building back up. Do you get what I mean? If, if every time you try to, um, let's say you've gone through what your, your people have gone through, other people have gone through 300 years of slavery or 400 years of slavery, and then we come out of that and when you're trying to build businesses they're even getting burnt down or they're finding ways to get you out <laughs> or there were i think there were two black males i cannot remember their names but they opened up um i think it was a bank they opened up a bank but they opened it under two white males so they had two white males basically being the faces of the business as mm. ceos but also employing black people to give black people in the community an opportunity to get work once they got found out that they weren't the actual people running the company because all the strings were being pulled by the two black guys, the second they found that out, they got imprisoned. 
Do you get what I mean? So it's like, if there's yeah. these constant blocks along the way that every time you try to raise your head above sea level, you're getting pushed down. At some point, people are human, you're going to stop trying. <laughs> and we're talking about hundreds of years of this consistently happening. It's not something that we blinked and it happened 50 years ago. We're talking about it's happening now. Yes, things have gotten better, but there are still many ways in which these sort of blockages haven't been removed. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, what you just said, that is very, 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 I think, you did, I think you said it very, very, you articulated very well. And um, it was so true to the point because it's like, yeah, we're human. We're going to stuff up. <laughs> like, we're just going to get tired. Like, the Central Park thing you're talking about, I think it was, is it Seneca Village? It used to be called, I think, mm. or something like that, And um, which was basically in the abbreviation for Senegal Village because, you know, the, this is the racist, this is how racist I think you know, they were carrying on towards us. I think it was something to do with the people were as black as Senegalese people or African people or whatever. Something like that. I don't know. I, I could be yeah, wrong. Don't yeah. call me on that. But um, No, you're like, right. It's Seneca Village. Seneca it's Village, isn't it? Yeah. So um, when you're dealing with this place like Seneca Village, when you're dealing with a place like Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, where they're calling it the Black Wall Street, you know, um, where, and this, see, this is the funny thing. You've got Tulsa, Oklahoma now. When you look at pictures of Tulsa, Oklahoma, you can see white people in there shopping. You can yeah. see, you know, there's no, we're not holding no racial um, discrimination towards them or any prejudice towards them at all. And 1921, if you do the math, that's what, 100 years or roughly just under 100 years from the abolishment of slavery. That's, mm. uh, you know, that's during segregation, because again, the whole reason why there was a Tulsa, Oklahoma, was um, a Black Wall Street was because of um, the segregation laws that were passed after slavery, mm. you know, and the lynching as well that was going on. So it's like... There's a thing as well, sorry, just to quickly yeah, mention um, mm. that obviously there were a lot of Irish people as well that were bandished out, as well as the black people. So it was that whole connotation of no... No, no, um, black. well, no blacks, no, no Irish, no dogs. So they were also a part of that village in terms of the working life, and and they were living together. They were cohabiting fine. <laughs> so it's not an issue, but it's been made more of an issue because if you notice nowadays, mm. there's a whole shift in bringing in like I don't know. It's like the whole idea. So that no blacks, no Irish, no dogs it's been changed <laughs> and it's like no actually we need more people on our side because actually we're being a bit outnumbered here we can't have you guys getting along so let's introduce this new idea a new perception of black people and let's bring all of that it's kind of like how you know how the european borders were opened what just mm -hmm. for just for britain to leave the eu how does that make sense <laughs> so it clearly wasn't open because you're like oh we're one let's just open it up it makes sense there were, there were specific reasons and benefits that were thought to be had in opening those borders and then closing them back up again. You find every 20 years is, you know, oh, you know, anyone can come into our country. You know, it's fine. You know, we're, 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 we're a country of freedom, you know, mm -hmm. or we're, like America, we're a country of peace or whatever. So they invite you in now. Whilst they have their plans on building infrastructure, um, enhancing you know businesses so for example if you're looking at the early 2000s you're going to get a lot of construction companies being set up in the UK quite a lot there was construction companies there from before don't get me wrong but it was even more now because everybody's gearing up for 2012 which was the Olympics mm. um, also there was aspects of gentrification that were long to happen anyway you know so there's this like there's always like this 30 year plan I find with gentrification every 30 years so they will have an area like, for example, if you go Peckham, if you go to go to Peckham or Elephant and Castle 30 years ago, you know, it was a run down area. It was an area that no one wanted to go live in, you know, yeah. the, the, the knife crime, the correct, the black on black crime, you know, all those sort of stuff was so high and whatever. It was, you know, um, it was advertised as this horrible place to live. Now, 30 years later, you're seeing them building these tall skyscrapers. You're seeing them now have space within these estates because if you look at their buildings versus our buildings we had. Our mm. buildings were, you know, if I can remember correctly, watching one documentary, they were comparing it to how these were similar to certain concentration camp structures in the Nazi camps back in World yeah. War II. You know, so you've got these tall estates, 
you know, 20 tower block estates with like one small playground at the bottom. Whereas they're now building their story buildings and their apartments and you're finding that it's nothing, nothing even higher than maybe 10 floors. And on top of each floor, they've got a balcony. You know, they've got a, um, a nice garden terrace, terrace at the top. There's a lot yeah. of space at the bottom. There's underground parking. So essentially, they could build better places. When you've got government officials lying, saying, oh, we can't afford to build this or the government hasn't got money to... Coronavirus has shown us that they're all liars. You know, because when there's a crisis, clearly the Bank of England can print money. I mean, they may pull it in these smart words and say, you know, uh, due to this or due to that. But essentially, you know, I think they call it quantitative easing. But mm. essentially, you know, who's going to, who, if you are someone that prints money, if you're in charge of the Bank of England, uh, maybe somebody educate me on this. Who is going to tell you when and when you can't print money? Mm. You feel me? No one ain't going to tell you that. Like, that's like you, that's like you owning water and you're supplying your area of water. And then they're, they're, apparently there's a shortage of water. So you turn off the taps. What's the punishment for you turn off the taps if you own the water? Do you see what I'm coming from? Yeah. It goes back to the whole ownership thing again, which is where I'm going to move into now with gentrification. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like with gentrification, I would, and I'm going to be real, our problem, I think our problem as black people was, again, like I said in my previous episode, when we came to this country, those of our parents that were from Africa or the Caribbean, um, some of us may have had a plan, but majority of us never really had a plan. A lot of it was escapism from, you know, certain um, atrocities, some of the African governments that at the time, you know, were, were doing towards our people, which, you know, we have to understand the cycle here when it comes to us coming to England. We're only coming to the UK because, again, the UK has advertised it as a better opportunity. Two, they have advertised that as a better opportunity. So they've advertised London or the UK as a better opportunity after they've already gone into our country and destroyed it. So yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so they take our resources, you know, they take our, our, our agriculture, they destroy our culture and replace it with a false one so that we'll never, ever get back to that structural system of, 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 of African, you know, morals and whatnot. And then years later, use that to develop their countries and they say hey you know is it tough over in Ghana hey come to London you know if you, you, you London's gonna make it easier for you you're gonna have clean water a roof over your head you yeah. know fresh food no disease and contamination you know according to them um, but then again back to the gentrification thing now this is where I always tell black people where we slipped up we didn't buy no infrastructure now, when I mean infrastructure, I'm not talking about your, your grandma's house or your mum's house. Obviously, shout out to all the grandmothers that did do it. I respect them and I rate them for it because, again, you know, they understood ownership. So those that bought their house back in the days. Now, like ATM said in the, in the last podcast, it was very easier. It was very easy to buy houses back in those days because you can get 100% mortgage. You know, mm. um, I know my grandma's days, houses were going for like, like I'm hearing houses were going for like nine grand. And you, and you just yeah. sit back. You're like, what, nine grand? It's 2020 now. That's not even enough for a deposit for even a 5%. Yeah. You know what's there like? So what they keep doing is this. So gentrification is like you get an area, they'll say, oh, we're going to move all the poor people into this area here. So the Windrush generation, you know, these so-called, they're not poor, sorry, I shouldn't say that. We're going to move these um, Africans, these Caribbeans into this area here in the 70s with the Nigerians and got names and whatnot. And what we're going to do is... We're going to leave them there, yeah? And once we leave them there, we're going to keep certain things in place so they stay there. So, you know, we're going to keep uh, um, council housing there, knowing that they're going to go for that because obviously it's a free house. And we're going to keep um, a lot of the opportunities for or, or, or the areas for them to build their cultural systems in those areas. So, for example, certain um, um, churches, certain religious institutes can obviously be built there. Um, you, you may have the permission to have like certain things like football clubs or whatever. So they'll have a little, they'll have small little trinkets of things that we can do, which gives us hope. But at the same time, we know, or they know that it's actually keeping us there because the plan is in 30 years time, they're going to run down this particular area and then we're going to swoop in, buy everything up at, on the cheap because obviously the property levels are going to go down. People don't realize that the Haygate estate 
like most people were moved out or shipped into like Birmingham, some parts of South, like Surrey Keys and Birmingham, if they're lucky. But a lot of people shipped out to Birmingham, Croydon, and, and Luton as well. And yeah. um, the estate was a left for about a good while. Like you could go to the Haygate estate back in 20, 2011, 2010, and you could see like the grass was taller than me. You know, I'm six foot two. The grass was taller than me. You definitely was right infested. You know, a lot of um, buildings and apartments were empty. Do you see where I'm coming from? So they deliberately do that. Yeah, now, yeah. if we had bought infrastructure, so for example, if we had bought, if we had kept a lot of our small businesses open, um, if we had bought, um, if we had put money into a lot of the um, infrastructure with like, like flats and apartments collectively, if we had bought things like even like our youth clubs, for example, if you look at a youth club, a youth club is run off a council funded scheme in order to help the youth in the yeah. um, you know, to, to, to help, I should say, um, in in those sort of areas there. Yeah? If we all put our money up, we could have kept the youth clubs running. We could, have, we could have kept the brownie clubs running. We could have kept those same, because essentially the money now in the community will circulate quicker back to you. So if you've got your aunt, your uncle own, like you were saying about your um, your uh, your brother, I think it's your brother-in-law who owns the Ugandan shop. Um, yeah. and your dad only shops there. If you had like, say we had 12 of those sort of situations. Okay. So those yeah. people... Yeah, in, let's just say, for example, a place like Elephant Castle, yeah? Um, what you would find is that during times, not even during times of need, but because the spending is so frequent that money will be coming back quicker to you, which means you have enough money to invest back into your communities. And on top of that as well is you would then teach your kids the ethics of group economics because they're going to be like, well, why would I go and work another job when my dad owns two or three shops? And in fact, I'm seeing the progression as I'm growing up because through these shops and through these investments that my family has made or, and the family next door and other family down the road, we can keep the youth clubs open. We can keep the football clubs open. You know, um, we're now actually campaigning now because this, again, this is what leads into your voting locally and, and putting pressure on your local MP. If your local MP now, yeah, that rather like, these lot in the community together circulate, you know, such and such money between them. Um, and on top of that as well, you know, they, 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 they own some of these places freehold, then they will support it. If you say to them, look, we're going to raise you 10 grand, but this is our community and we need this to stay open. We need the youth clubs to stay open because they help us deal with the youth directly instead of these support groups or the police stop and search, tried and all these other infrastructures that don't like want prevention measures instead of, um, right. after, yeah. Right, more prevention methods. Like, raw, like how you know the ones there? Like, if we had that, if we had those sort of things, then gentrification wouldn't have happened. If you go to Southall now, yes, there's a lot of new buildings. Be, and, and our, our people always get on me, oh, why are you always using Southall? Because when I go into Southall, I'm just letting you guys know what I see. You know what I'm saying? Like, or even, um, mm. uh, what's that part in East London? Um, not, I would, I would, would I say Leightonstone? Leightonstone? Um, parts of uh, like you know, even Stratford as well. You go into some of these areas, yeah, you're seeing these new builds, but you'd be surprised that a lot of these Asians own them, a lot of these Indians own them, you know, a lot of them still have got their corner shops or their butchers. Do you see what I'm coming from? I think as well, it then falls into the whole idea of like education, and it's like you were saying earlier, like the education. You, I don't know if you said it earlier today, actually, but I'm sure it was mentioned that the education you receive in a private school is very different to the education you receive in public schools and you're mm. taught in different ways and you're exposed to a lot more. That's true. That's true. Do you know what I mean? And like, it, it's very different and I see it in my niece because her, her, the way her school was set, it's not a private school, um, but it is a really good school and the area that she's in, she's out there. <laughs> so, but the way they teach in that school is very much like, um, you know, the idea is that they've got you thinking from young, what is it that you want to do? There's interest there in your particular interest. And then they're being very real about you, about the market you're going into, what your competitors might be doing. My niece is 16 and she's already very much on her way to opening up a side business from now. Mm. Book wise, she wants to do something else. But in terms of like, I want to make money. And the reality is, is for a lot of people, they sometimes start a businesses that way and end up staying in it because it's making them so much money. So it's like, why am I going to occur all these debts 
by going to uni, so it's fine, I'll stay here and do this. But mm. she's 16 and already she's set herself up in a way that she's good to go. And it's like, at 16, that was not the focus in my school. My school was interested in whether or not you could be part of the athletics team. <laughs> Literally, yeah. it was, could you be part of the athletics team and can you represent the school? That was like just, their bigger interest. Just to interject here, so as a car, you, mm. your need to school, is that a state school or is that private school? It's state. State school, okay. But that's, even just down to the demographics, that's what I'm saying, in terms of her, the area in which her school is, is out there. Mm. So yeah. literally, it's just like that whole, you know when they talk about the idea, because I think it is a case of private schools, yes, they do definitely teach you differently, but also where you live. <laughs> Because if you live in a particular type of area, let's say you live in an area where most people are literally middle class up, your private school is going to be very different <laughs> to the private school in an area that's predominantly full of people who are dependent on, on government funds. Mm. Yeah, and that's not to say that it's impossible, but that's where you get stories where they look at them and it's like, oh, it's breakthrough stories because we put so much in the way of you being successful in terms of where you live, <laughs> what you're exposed to every day, what you see, what you don't know, but you still managed to make it like, well done. That's why such a big deal was made about that. But it mm. is a lot to do with the way that things are set up. And I think the whole um, idea of gentr gentrification, what, it's annoying because the idea is that you move. I've known so many people that have just been, as in so many families that have literally been up and moved out of areas when they've decided we're going to do it up. And it's like, as you were saying, the area will be broken down, it'll be unkept, <laughs> and it'll be like that. And they're leaving you there. And the second they're like, actually, we're going to put some money into this. First things first, you've got to go. They did it in Newham. In Newham, when Stratford Olympics was coming, some people got moved from, like, to other parts of Stratford where they were a little bit further out. Other people got moved out of Newham to Thurrock, so, like Essex. When people, and I think as well, this is another thing, yeah. When people look at it and they're like, oh, you know, um, you got all the black families are moving in. Not all of them are buying and moving in. Some of them have been just being moved by the council. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Literally. And the council yeah, decided yeah, that yeah. this is where they're going to put them. And you get people that live in those areas that are like, the, the area's going downhill. And then they move again, <laughs> but then you've created, there's a new area that's been created that's looked, that's frowned upon, looked down at, and it's like, ah, oh, this used to be so great, but now it's squalor because they've decided to invest money in other areas and not keep those same people there. And it's the same thing with, I think it's happened in, it happened in Newham for a good period of time, because I know a lot of people that got moved out. Um, and when I say moved out, as in far. <laughs> it's happened in... Um, yeah, like it just happened all over London. And I think the whole idea is that beggars can't be choosers, isn't it? So if we decide that you don't fit our demographic here anymore, we're going to send you out. Like, mm. I think the council's changed now, where it's like, if you're working, there are more opportunities for you in terms of, there's a better opportunity if you get in a house now in Newham, if you're working, than there was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was like, I remember speaking to some people in the council, many of them were just like, if you have a baby, you'll be a priority. Very indirectly telling me, go and have a baby. I'm not, like, I didn't, oh, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, I didn't fall for it and I could see through what they were saying and not saying. Oh. So it was a, well, if you had a baby, well, if you had a baby, well, if oh. you had a baby. Now, if that message keeps being fed to you and you are desolate, like you're at the point where you've got nowhere to go, nobody to turn to, what's the likelihood that you're going to do? Probably going to go have, have a baby. A baby. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, baby, so yeah. It is a case of it's like you're telling this to young people and young minds with the idea that, well, we're telling you what you need to go do and until that happens, sorry, no, I can really help you. I could have helped you if you... It's not necessary. Just say you can't help people. You tell people that you can't help them all the time. <laughs> do you get what I mean? You don't give them indirect guides into how to get housed. But nowadays, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You see, just to interject here, um, so to cut you, but you, you said something very, very, very interesting, which is key to one of our next topics, um, the next couple of weeks later. Uh, when you spoke about them forcing the whole having a child to get a flat sort of thing, you see, my thing is, this is where I see, again, 
the slick ways of trying to make us think integration works, but it doesn't. You're essentially breaking up the family. Because what you find with the integration, what you find with the whole, um, the, the whole, um, what's it? The whole council housing. And, and you, you give the entitlement of a family or a roof over your head with your child. You give that entitlement to the mother. There's no inclusion of the father at all. And what you do is at the young age, like you were saying, you know, you start the child on a dysfunctional path of, well, essentially, I don't need a man. I don't need a father because the government give me money. The government pay for me to have a place with my child. And then we're going to now, 10, 15 years later, give you the whole, you know, whole right to buy this property, but it's underneath the woman's name. And this is where you're now starting to see the early breakups of the black family because the next generation, which is our generation from that, have now got to this point where it's very, very hard to even keep a relationship or even keep some form of family structure because we've integrated into a society where the government feeds the needs of both male and female principles in a household. So, for example, the males don't get anything. Let's just keep it 100, yeah? The males don't get anything. But when it comes to maybe a skilled job as a worker, uh, maybe it comes to you getting a job as a, a plumber or whatever, you could do that. You could do that and not go to college and whatever. Whereas with the girls now, they pump them up with the whole aspect of, oh, just like you said, have a baby, have a baby, you know, get a place. You have a baby now. Automatically, you now use your child as this bargaining chip with the system. So you put your child through all the necessary, you know, all the necessary, um, the, oh, well, if you're a single parent and you can't afford to, you know, look after your child, you have child-minded or childcare. So you go and get childcare. Now with the childcare now, you find that there is also uh, an aspect of you now saying, well, hold on, childcare is going up every single year. And what the government's giving me is not actually enough. So I have to work. But then they catch you and they say, well, you can't work full time. You've got to work part time. Can you see where I'm coming from? So this mm -hmm. whole integration, which is going to lead me on to my next point in a sec. You're finding that there is a, it's like this whole, um, um, this whole kind of, um, you know, you're not worthy. You're not ready just yet. You know, what I'm, I'm trying to think what movie is that from? I don't know if it was Star Wars or whatever. But it's kind of like the whole four hammers, four hammers con concept sort of thing. No one can wield it until they're worthy of whatever. Now, that's what we've been going through, I feel, as black people in this country for the last hundred years. And you find with, even in the 1950s, people don't realise that council housing started because in the 1950s, you had a lot of these World War II veterans that were homeless. And it was an embarrassment for people to travel to London and see men that fought in the war to keep this country safe, homeless on the floor. So they had to clean it up. They had to clean it up. Oh, we're going to have all these council housing, you know, um, for to house all these people. Do you know what I'm saying? So when you're um, looking back to, we go back to gentrification now. That's where I feel we obviously kind of um, messed up on. And again, it all goes back to how this thing served us and how having, how, how having not having a plan has made it even worse. Because if you look, we're going to talk, we're going to have an episode solely on the whole black family you know the whole the so-called black independent woman and you know the toxic masculine you know uh, uh, narrative that we see a lot we're going to talk about all of that because again um you can see these things here are are, are, are very key you know helping us moving on and solving these solutions so with gentrification we definitely missed out and there was an aspect because a lot of people will use this as an excuse and i'll end with gentrification i'll end with, with this here on gentrification you know a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, I couldn't afford it. I never had the money. I was on council housing, I was on benefits. But then what you do find is there is a, a heavy party culture, <laughs> drug culture as well, which is obviously, again, um, I can't, we can't blame white supremacy for everything. Do you see where I'm coming from? There is an aspect mm -hmm. of us adhering to some of these, 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 um, these escapisms. And there was a lot of that going on. There was a lot of that going on up until... You know, and it still is going on.
But what you're finding is that we missed our opportunity, which now leads me to my next question. And, you know, my last point, where we're dealing with, do, do you think we need black nationalism? Because so where we're dealing just, just, just oh, before yeah, I answer that, I just want to say one more thing on the last topic. Is yeah. the reality is, is it, it's what's been put out there, and I think that that in, like that idea of gentrification in particular. What I don't want people to sort of not understand is obviously it's not a case where all black people live in council properties and they're mm. the only ones. Like it does definitely impact across the races like if you fall into poverty is like a separate thing <laughs> do you get what i mean and if you fall into that category you can all go <laughs> they don't care that don't that they don't discriminate in that do you get what i mean and it is a case of that there's that there is that culture of escapism you know it's like idle hands <laughs> so they say devil makes work for idle hands if you've got nothing to do all day and you're sitting around all day your situation's probably depressive because of what you're seeing you know, and it depends on, I guess, your mind and what you've got in your mind. Like, if you can see outside of your current situation, they tend to be the people that make it out. If you see no out of your situation and you think this is it, and they, it's been driven so far into your mind that this is it and this is as good as it gets, likelihood is you'll go through the cycle of deprivation and it's an active thing. It's a factual thing. It exists. It happens. 